Hey there, it's Jason from Codemanship with not a, not a full-blown video, video diary entry, um, just a short one this time, but also this new laptop I'm recording on here has not been set up for video editing yet, um, so this is going to be raw um, and hopefully fairly quick. Now, I posted something on LinkedIn and Twitter over the weekend. Um, it was uh, about um, null checking um, in, in core logic, but it was maybe... I was a bit being a bit too specific there. Really, what I was talking about is invalid, invalid data. Essentially, um, uh, checking for invalid data in your core logic. My point was that you shouldn't need to do it. Really, um, that invalid data should not make it that far. Um, now, I wanted to illustrate this with a very simple uh, example, which is a square root calculator. You give it a number, it calculates the square root, but the number must be positive. It must be greater than or equal to zero, otherwise we're going to end up in an infinite loop here. So there is a precondition for this root uh, function before we reach the body of it that the number has to be greater than or equal to zero. And if it's not, then here in this defensive version, um, we throw um, an argument exception. Now, this is a very com common style of programming, but when you put it in your core logic, um, first of all, it, it complicates the code, um, and if you've got lots of checks you need to do it, it can make it very complicated. But also, it doesn't necessarily simplify the client code, because the client still has to handle that exception. And of course, if they don't, then it's going to bubble all the way up the core stack unhandled until it reaches the user interface, which is largely considered to be bad form. Um, let me just illustrate that now. I've got a little web service that's using this root uh, method here. Um, so hopefully we'll get a... Yeah. So if I give it a number to calculate the root of, like 25 for example, we get a nice little output hopefully saying the square root of 25 is 5. Now if I give it an invalid uh, number, a negative number, like minus 1 for example, um, we get an unhandled exception. Now, this is just the default ASP.NET Core um, developer error page. Um, many websites have some kind of default error page that gives a, a very helpful message like, oops, something went wrong. Um, but the idea basically is this is not meaningful user experience. Um, now the thing about defensive programming, particularly throwing an exception, is that you are actually changing the user experience here. You are changing, but you might not think that you are. You might not realize that you're doing it. Developers often, I often find developers writing code that throws exceptions or handles exceptions, for example, that is actually defining the user experience, but they're not actually thinking about the user experience. So you get those kind of unhelpful messages. Maybe helpful for us to debug it, but not very helpful for the end user. Now, uh, an alternative to defensive programming is what we call design by contract, where instead of having the supplier in, a, in an interaction between two objects, for example, or two functions, instead of having the supplier check that the precondition holds, we actually put the check into the client code, in this case into the web server. So if the number is less than zero, and then we have to make a decision. The client decides what to do in this particular situation. For example, we display a helpful message like, please enter a positive number. So here we're defining user experience but we're doing it explicitly in the client code. Let's run that again and see what kind of experience we get instead. Okay, any minute now. Yeah, so here if we ask for the square root of minus one, instead of that nasty unhandled exception, we get a, a nice friendly, user-friendly message with, with some instructions there. So um, that's one of the big advantages of design by contract is, if you think about it, if you go to, if you think of a situation where you might um, not satisfy a precondition, like for example, if you're, you're trying to catch a flight at an airport and you've forgotten your, your passport. Now, um, they can check that defensively at the gate and go, no, you say you have to have a passport. Um, but they can't tell you what to do if you don't have a passport. That's not up to them, that's up to you. Do you, do you rush home and get it? Do you phone someone at home and, and ask them to bring it? Um, is there not enough time? So maybe you've got to now find a, a, a train ticket to get home or book into a hotel uh, and, and rearrange the flight for the next day or something. What do you do? That's up to you. In the same case here, if the number is less than zero, 
what to do is decided by the client. It is part of the, uh, the client experience, the user experience. Now, there are places where we would do design by contract, typically your core logic. You would assume in your core logic that Duff data does not get that far. When I see defensive checks in core logic, it, it reminds me a little bit of living in, in student houses or shared houses where everyone has, you know, locks on the door, basically. <laughs> everyone has padlocks on the door. Uh, strongly implying that either the people in the house don't trust each other in the same way that if you're de de defensive checks in your core logic, what you're saying is I don't trust me or the other developers in this team not to call this function um, under invalid circumstances or with invalid data. Or it implies that your external security needs beefing up. And what I've done here is I've beefed up the external security. So I'm programming defensively around the edges where data is coming into the application from user interfaces or from web services or from databases, which is another form of input. Um, and so I'm protecting my core logic from Duff data at the edges. So it's a nice, pristine and simple in the core. Um, so that's where I would normally do defensive programming. And then I would assume, no, we're never going to get that far. If, the, if it's a negative number, we'll never actually call that method. Because it's not enough that the, the root uh, method is correct by itself. The software is only correct if the people calling that root, root method are calling it when they're supposed to. Or if you're throwing exact exceptions, handling that exception when it happens in a meaningful way. So correctness is really is not just defined by the individual modules or classes. It's defined by the interactions between them being correct too. Um, and therefore, design by contract simplifies those interactions by saying, look, the client has obligations that they have to meet. They can only call the root method when the number is positive. Um, and once we've established that, then that makes the root function much, much simpler. And it allows us to define the user experience in a more meaningful way. We're not just throwing unhandled exceptions. Now, having said all of that, in design by contract, uh, what people will sometimes do is say, look, in production, we don't want to be throwing these exceptions, but during testing, we would like to know if that's actually happened. We'd like to know if someone's called this method when uh, they shouldn't. So you might, for example, in C-sharp, we can use um, debug assert, and we can ask if the number is greater than or equal to zero at that point. So assertions allow us to ask at any point in the execution of a program whether something is true. Um, and we could use that during testing only, um, to make sure that nobody is actually calling this method when the number is negative. So you could put that in. Um, it's another form of defensive programming, but it is defensive programming um, during debugging and testing, essentially. Um, it doesn't necessarily make it into production, and you still need to think about the, um, the, uh, the user experience. It also has the, um, the advantage of documenting what the preconditions are. So if someone wants to know, when am I allowed to call the root method, they can go look and see if there are any assertions put before the body of that method. But I don't normally do that these days. I tend to rely much more on unit testing. Um, and if you've got really good unit tests for your core logic, um, and also the, the code that is calling your core logic um, that's validating the input data, um, if you make that unit testable as well, um, then you usually don't have the need to do all these internal checks because you've already essentially checked um, by testing. Um, and don't forget that inspections are also a good way of catching that thing as well. Just read the code and go, when wouldn't this work? Okay, let's go look at the, uh, the functions that are calling this. We could, for example, go look to all the um, references. Let's find the usages. Okay. And we could go through those usages and say, okay, could that ever be less than zero? Well, the line before says it can't because we were bang out at that point. Okay. Well, anyway. That's the difference between defensive programming and design by contract. I would typically use design by contract for my core logic, so no null checks or anything like that, because those things shouldn't make it that far. Um, I would typically use defensive programming at the edges of the architecture to basically beef up my external security so that I don't have to have put padlocks on all the doors, um, in the internal doors. And um, I would uh, typically rely much more on, on automated testing to reassure myself that all the rules are being satisfied than um, you know, things like null checking and throwing exceptions and stuff like that, which makes the, uh, the whole thing rather complicated and clunky.
anyway there you go there's my little post for today i hope that's cleared up some things for you um i hope it's made some sense and maybe it's given you some ideas anyway stay safe until the next proper video diary